um, we have Lucy Lynn from the San Francisco Commission, Arts Commission, Randall Klein from SF Jazz, and Scott Harton, Horton from Scott Horton Communications. And Benji, um, Benji Rogers from Pledge Music is on his way from the airport. Hopefully he'll be here really soon. He's flying in from London, so it's, you know, you can only plan so much. <laughs> so I thought I would just start the conversation. Um, well, first I think it's important to recognize that um, each of the panelists represent a different prism on the same topic, um, how artists can successfully present themselves. So we have a publicist, we have um, a funder, and we have a presenter, a festival presenter, and, um, and then we'll have Benji who facilitates like, a digital version of patronage, so a lot like Kickstarter. So I wanted to talk to each of them, sort of get out of them what they see as the important parts of what people, what our musicians and composers need to have in their toolbox. The, the, um, the phrase that Francis Wong used in the panel earlier was, what makes you grant ready, or <laughs> was that it? Um, what things do you need to document? When you, what things do you need to have on hand? When you, what, do you, uh, should, what should you focus on if you have a limited budget? So we'll get into those, but I wanted to start uh, by just having each panelist talk a little bit about who they are, what they do in this role, um, how they interface with musicians and composers, and what their um, role is with that. So Lucy, why don't you start? Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy Lin. I'm a program associate with the San Francisco Arts Commission in the Cultural Equity Grants Program. The Arts Commission has many programs, and we're the grants arm of um, what we do in a bigger public a agency there, and it's a um, local government city. So with our grants program, we fund specifically uh, San Francisco-based individual artists and arts organizations in different capacities. For individual artists, we have an Individual Artist Commission's granting program for the creation of new work. And with arts organizations, we fund from infrastructure building um, to project grants to facilities development. So you may be able and eligible to apply for either an individual or as an organization if you have a group or work with an ensemble. So um, yeah, the program. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Randall Klein. I'm the executive artistic director of SF Jazz, which is a nonprofit presenting organization here that presents uh, music centered around jazz, mostly jazz. Uh, we present about 100 concerts a year. Uh, we're, we're known mostly for a, a one of event that we produce called the San Francisco Jazz Festival, but we're, even the San Francisco Jazz Festival really isn't a festival in the sense of uh, most people thinking of big outdoor events with multi-acts on a big stage. Uh, it's more of a concert series, more of a, excuse me, more of a traditional uh, performing arts type series. Um, and uh, I've been doing it for 28 years there, so I've seen a lot of this. I, was, I studied to be a musician myself, so I understand a little bit what it means to be on the other side of the fence. Um, I, th I thought that might be a good path to follow. Um, Good luck, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, but I've also sat on the on Scott's side of the fence as well too. I worked as a publicist and did uh, marketing primarily for music and arts groups for for many many years. So I I, I, I can see this world from a lot of different angles. And uh, you know, as we get talking, um, I'll, I'll be brutally honest about <laughs> what what I think uh, are the things that really can make a difference. Hi everybody, my name is Scott Horton. <coughs> I'm an independent, excuse me, <coughs> and voiceless um, communications and marketing consultant. Uh, like Randall, I've been at this for about 30 years. Um, also like Randall, my background is in music, uh, musicology. Um, my specialty was 14th century French music. And at a very early age in grad school, I decided there wasn't much of a future in that and went into public relations and marketing. So also like Randall, Good luck to you all. I admire you all pursuing this. Um, you'll probably be a lot better at it than, than I was. Um, I basically help artists and arts organizations tell their stories. Um, I help them get media coverage. I help them market and get butts and seats for performances and CDs into home CD players and on radio stations and uh, that sort of thing. And from my point of view, it really is all about helping people like you tell your stories in ways that are going to get you past an editor or a critic's desk and 
uh, into the faces and homes and hearts of uh, readers and listeners. Thank you so much, Scott. I thought we would start by asking Randall a few questions about um, what he thinks is important as his role as a presenter, because sometimes I think um, that's the first um, sort of first line of engagement we have with uh, presenters and funders. It's uh, getting a show or getting a um, getting to be able to be part of a bigger bigger um, performance. So, Randall, I thought I'd ask you, you know, what are the things you think are important and um, essential for our musicians to have as, as they start to engage with presenters? I mean, all the things that you need, you know what you need. <laughs> I mean, they're all the things that do that really document the work that you all do, and you've got to pay attention to those things. Um, you know, obviously you need samples of your music that can tell the story of what you do. Um, I am actually not a big fan of listening to a lot of CDs, interestingly enough. I do listen to a lot of them, uh, but because I book live music, I much prefer the live performance to see. So in this age of video and YouTube, you can see a lot more of that. It still doesn't really sort of give you the sense of what it is, but you know, I'm, I'm, I am looking for dynamic live performers of people who can engage audiences, and you know, that's a multifaceted thing, so uh, meaning that it's not only that you can engage an audience, but that you have an audience to engage. Um, and it, it, it's an important thing to get you sort of in, in the door, uh, always. I mean, I have a lot of artists that call me directly. I actually, you know, <laughs> there's only one artist I've told not to call me anymore, but uh, <laughs> most, and I did it in a nice way. Um, and I didn't really tell them not to call me anymore, but I really actually welcome the, the calls. I, I want to hear what it is, and, and I am actually brutally honest about what people's chances are, um, you know, to, to get a gig. I don't want to lead anyone down a path. Um, that is going to lead them to believe that there may be a gig where there isn't a gig. Um, but it's very important for you all to be brutally honest, too, with yourselves about what you can expect, where you can go. Um, so, yes, have the basic materials, have the stuff you think you need, you know, you have it written down. If you have anybody or any way to sort of document, um, this is a hard thing, I think, with, with, all, with artists. Um, you're, 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 everyone is a great artist, and in my position, I'm trying to book artists who actually can bring audiences with them. Like I said, we're not a festival where we, we do a lot of the unknown act that will be on a multiple engagement. Someone's got to really sort of carry their own. And so I want to hear how you do that. I was just talking with a musician, a great musician from Costa Rica, um, who lives in Santa Barbara and you know, produces incredible music. But he's never played a gig here where he's held his own. And the music is as good as a lot of the music I hear. And, the, and I, you know, I told him, there's really nothing I can do for you how we book um, to help you until you play a few gigs in the Bay Area and you've proven you've done your thing. A and I think the most important thing to know, apart from the kit, I think that part's easy, actually, to know what you need to produce. I think you need to know who you're talking to, literally not the person, but the, 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 um, the, the place you want the gig. Just because it says, in our case, San Francisco Jazz Festival, doesn't necessarily mean that that may be the best place for you, or you understand why you should be there. Um, you know, this part same particular artist thought we did a multi-stage thing, and thought we did that, and thought, you know, you know, give me a shot, you know, I can do. And I said, well, you know, we don't do it that way, and it would have saved him a lot of trouble because I, I know how hard it is to make the call that he he makes, which is, you know, you're an artist, you're putting your, you know, you're you're trying to, you know prove your worth, you know, in a certain sense. And someone like me, some schmuck is up there, you know, telling you, you, you deserve a gig or you don't deserve a gig. And the truth is, everyone, you know, re and d does deserve the gig. But in the end, not everyone can get the gig. And so the things I always want to see are people who know, you know, just like anyone tells you to get a job anywhere, you know, know who, <laughs> know the place you want your job, understand what it is, that, that at least helps you have the conversation as well, too. You'll, you'll engage in a longer conversation. And over the course of time, if you are not ready at that particular place, for whatever reason, uh, you, you develop a relationship. And the things I like to get all the time, I want to be in everyone's email lists. I want to be on mailing lists. I want to know where you're playing. I want to know what's going on. That, tells, that gives me a sense of the energy of everyone who's an artist. They're out there. They're, they're doing stuff. Because gigs are not easy to get. And they're getting harder to get. And people who are out there hustling it, it helps. It helps to know that people are hustling because when it comes time to the gig, we all need all the resources we can do. Just because you get a gig, say, at the San Francisco Jazz Festival doesn't ensure you're going to get a good audience. 
And it's helpful to me to know that you have mailing lists, you have fans, your Facebook page has lots of friends, you've got all these things. They're all helpful that you will also mobilize. So those are the things that help as well, too. It, it, it isn't just that. I mean, ultimately it comes down to you know, being a great artist, but those other things support that. And so it's important to communicate you know, why you're a good artist, why people come to see you play, why you'll do well in this particular place with you know, numbers, not just, I can do great for you, that line I hear all the time, but it, even the agents who I've worked with for many, many years tell me that, and you know, I, don't, you know, I, I don't believe it all <laughs> the time. And so, you know, we do take chances every once in a while, but the ones, the artists we take chances on generally are people who have moved along, they do have material, it, they tend to have, you know, professional material, but they tend to have, you know, you know good quotes from critics, good, um, you know, good audience response, they've sold X number of things. The key thing I want to see is you connect with an audience. I mean, that's the most important thing for me to see, that people want to see you. Um, and however you can get that across, that's to me the, the sort of the key the kicker. Great. So, Scott, um, it seems like some of the things that were in people's toolkits five years ago, ten years ago, you know, a good bio, some great, great photos, I mean, those are all really important still, but Randall brings up a point about, you know, there's data now. There's, there's things that we can quantify about your value in the space, and do you uh, counsel your clients at all about how they can engage and, and um, more quantify their value in the space these days. Oh, absolutely. I, I mirror completely what Randall said about what the media wants, like what he's looking for. The media are looking for exactly the same thing. They want to know that you can draw an audience. They want to know that you're the real deal. Um, they want to know that you can talk about yourself, so that you have materials to back you up, that you have a website, that you have a press kit, that you can write a news release about yourself. Um, so yeah, all the data that you can have um, and tell your story. And it's also really important to have very concise messaging. Think about what it is you're selling. Um, interestingly enough, you're, when you're talking about media coverage, you're not really, or even ticket sales, you're not really selling the performance. You're selling a concept of the performance or the CD. So you got to really sell that concept. Um, think of it as kind of the dust jacket on a book. If you're in a bookstore and you're looking at a book, you don't sit down and read the whole novel and decide if you're going to buy it. Well, maybe some of us do, but you look at the dust jacket and you read the synopsis and you see if you're interested in that or maybe you read the bio or you read some of the press quotes or here's a really interesting thing, some of the other author quotes or non-press quotes, which is really, really important, particularly for emerging artists or even established artists. Um, I have a client that I've been working, I'm in year three of a four-year major rebranding process with a half a million dollar grant for the San Francisco Girls Chorus. And they traditionally have not gotten a lot of critical coverage in the media because the media doesn't want to cover kids because they, A, think that they're not professional, um, B, they think, well, if we need to say something negative, we don't want to make the girls in the chorus cry. So, so, how, so we had a challenge of how do we communicate the the importance and the professional quality of the girls' chorus to a ticket-buying public and to the media if we don't have the New York Times quote or even many San Francisco Chronicle quotes. So we decided to get quotes from people in the music business. So the girls' chorus has performed for 30 years regularly with San Francisco Opera and San Francisco Symphony. So we got quotes from Michael Tilson Thomas, the music director of San Francisco Symphony, and from David Gockley, the general director of San Francisco Opera. And we immediately saw a spike in reaction in focus groups to people looking at the collateral materials. And from the media, wow, if Michael Tilson Thomas says they're the best, they must be the best. So I got to pay attention to them. So you have to think creatively in an age of dwindling media, uh, available media about how you present yourselves and think about those alternatives that are going to carry the same kind of clout and maybe as time goes on more clout. Um, in addition to experts in the field quotes about you, the number of hits you get on your website. Critics pay attention to that. Editors pay attention to that. Um, how you rank in Google ranking and, and most of us who are even minorly tech savvy, which is you know me, know that there are somewhat artificial and certainly tactical and strategic ways that you can get your search engine optimization up. You can pay money to do that. You can do all sorts of things about getting higher up in a Google search and the media pays attention to that. So that's something that didn't exist 10 years ago in terms of a criteria for looking at artists and if media is going to cover you and that's something that's very important now. 
Yeah, I just wanted, there, there's a great example of this that just happened in the Bay Area. There's an artist, I think his name is Carlos Varela, a Cuban artist who's they call the, the Cuban, first of all, they call him the Cuban Bob Dylan, so they immediately get him another thing. But it was, the billing for the, the gig was Jackson Brown Presents. So even more than the quote, I, I got pitched for, you know, to, by the agent to, to present that thing, you know, and Jackson Brown is going to endorse it, and it's going to be a name. And, you know, but will that sell, you know, the question becomes, does that sell tickets, does it not sell tickets? But it certainly, it worked to get him the gig at Yoshi's. So, you know, obviously Jackson Brown isn't going to put his name on something he doesn't believe in. That's something that people trust. You know, I think that's a great, great idea. You know, Amazon has taken it, you know, it's always been that way. You know, someone else has to like it before, you know, you can like it. Um, and, and Amazon does a great job of if you like this, you might like this. That's the same sort of thing. And then the final point I wanted to make is we used to sort of have this archetypal image of a publicist or, or promoter as kind of having a megaphone that you're shouting the message out to the world, carrying this message, and that's not really true anymore. The game changed with all of the electronic media and interactive media. People have the expectation when they buy a concert ticket or a CD today, the same expectation they bring when they use Amazon. They want to push a button, they want to get immediate service, they want to get a lot of access to a lot of um, levels of information. Um, so now the game has changed that, you know, your, your promoter and your publicist are kind of the center of an hourglass. So if you picture an hourglass with the sand, there's a lot of sand. Sometimes there's more on one side, which might be the audience and public side. The other side is your artistic side, your visionary side, your organizational side. And that shifts. So a couple of grains of sand at a time go through that center, which is your message. And you're, you're now having to pay attention to incoming messages as equally as sending out your outcoming message. So really think of your promotion as that center of an hourglass and not just sending stuff out into the void. Um, instead of doing PR and marketing, marketing in, in a linear and rhythmic fashion, since we're talking music, think about it as spherical and acoustical. You're sending this message out in all different directions, and you're paying attention when those ripples bounce off something in space and come back to you. What does that mean? What's it bouncing off of? What's that message for me? How do I change my marketing and promotional game based on that feedback that I'm getting? Lucy. Um, you have a slightly different, uh, you know, role in this, and I thought you'd just talk a bit about, you know, from the funding perspective, what you, you expect from people. Sure, and there's a lot of connections that can be made to what's been said um, just right now. And um, what I want to step back and, and just kind of present what a bigger picture of the funding world, and there's many types of funders, and you need to tailor your approaches depending on the type of funder, the, depending on the type of process that they um, accept proposals with and that they make their decisions with. So some of them may be, for example, the type of funders as private foundations, community foundations, um, corporate foundations, um, public agency grants programs such as the one I work for, um, including city, state, up to federal level, and also even local arts organizations that now have, some of them have their own redistribution, uh, re-granting programs that you can apply for. So there's all uh, these different levels and each one uses a different process. So you may see some with unsolicited proposals that have an open rolling deadline, um, some have annual deadlines. Um, for example, my program, um, which is different from unsolicited proposals, puts out an RFP, a request for, for proposals. and you come in and enter a competitive selection process um, in order to get recommended. Um, some other ones are, for example, by invitation only, um, where uh, foundations will solicit recommendations from professionals or peers in the community uh, to forward to um, their, their decision-making process. Um, so you, I mean, for each one, there needs to be a tailored approach and understanding the, what the values of the grant program are, what the funders are looking for, and usually for our foundations, you know, they have to answer to their their board or um, uh, for the arts commission. We have a, a broader arts commission um, um, committee that approves all the decisions. So, in in that sense, looking at um, you know, breaking that down and looking at what each process in, entails. And I'm going to talk about from cultural equity perspective, the process that we use is um, 
a, an RFP process, so we accept applications, um, and we have particular deadlines. And then what happens is that that goes to a peer panel review process, where you're pretty much presenting yourself through a written application and your work samples to a panel of people that you that might or might not know your work um, or the context of your work. So you're speaking via other vehicles, and you need to make sure those vehicles are as clear um, and are and articulate and well thought out in uh, both concept and idea as they are in your head. Because you have an idea of what your project should be and who you are in your head. And that translation to a written proposal um, for my program or for some other ones, there isn't even a written proposal. They might you know, ask you for um, a letter of inquiry, um, or they want an interview with you, or they want to do a studio site visit, um, go to your performance, things like that. But through this, it's it's a written proposal, and there's along with that, there's many other components um, that are equally as important. Um, so one of them, and it's been mentioned before, is how do you connect with your audience and community? For a public agency like mine, this is important because of where the funding comes from, and the requirements. Um, are that not only is this grant program for the creation of new work, but you need to ha fold in some form of public presentation with it. So in thinking about your public presentation, you, think, you have to think about and be able to articulate who you're going to be presenting to, who's going to be coming to your performances, and um, um, what are the characteristics of those audiences that will make your project successful. Um, so, so th those are some of the things that are um, specific to um, this process. And I also want to emphasize that along with the diversity of funders, there's a diversity of guidelines. And many times what we see coming through is that people don't read the eligibility requirements, they don't read the guidelines, they don't answer all the questions in the narrative. And they're there for a reason to help guide you. And if you feel like you have a good grasp and you have experience um, moving through the funding world and writing these proposals, that's fine. You can tell your story in your own unique way, but make sure to address all the questions, and especially for newer grant seekers. Um, it's, it's hard to uh, tie in a bigger picture of what you're trying to say um, when you're trying to balance your project budget along with you know, articulating the other resources, financial or other support that you may have. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend just reading the eligibility guidelines. Um, make sure you don't exhaust yourself as well as the other party. And somebody mentioned it's, uh, presenting yourself is kind of like looking for a job, finding a good fit. You don't want to apply for something again and again that you're just, you know, you might not have the qualifications for, or, or the, um, the employer is not. Um, they're looking for something specific, something other than what um, you may have. So, in a similar way, you want to find a good fit with the grant program as well, and really take your time to read through the requirements. Really take your time instead of uh, rushing yourself through it. And it'll show a rushed application is a rushed application. Um, and a poorly put together application is, is just that. So you really want to take your time and um, plan ahead. And that will reflect in your application and your thought process when you write. Um, is, a, is, a well, is your project well thought out and well planned? Um, will come through in, in your application. And that. Um, you know, you, sh you should call, I encourage you to call um, staff of um, foundations and funders, um, unless they say, please, no calls, then in that case, do not call. Um, but, um, you know, getting more information and also in terms of asking questions, be very specific about um, what your project is, what your ideas are, who you are. I often get questions saying, hi, I'm from this organization. Um, tell me about um, your, all your grant categories. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I'm just sitting there with like a mound of 
you know, work on my desk and I'm just trying to think through what the best questions that I need to ask them are to be able to direct them to the right grants program. So the more, the more questions that, and the more specifics that you can offer, the less work that a funder has to do to help you um, find the right funding for you. Um, and in those terms, um, it's, it's good to reach out and start building a relationship, um, like has that, what's been said before. Um, and if you do receive a grant, it's important to maintain that relationship with the funder um, to give updates on any major changes in your project along the way, which will happen. You'll have venue changes, you'll have date changes, you'll have um, uh, budget changes. So those are expected. Just communicate them to your funder, um, as well as be timely in, your, in any kind of reporting requirements that um, they're asking for and that are folded, uh, say, into your contract or into your grant agreement. Um, also, you know, and a very simple way of maintaining a relationship is to extend invitations to your performances. It's, uh, if, even if the, the person that you're offering it to cannot make it, they will know that you're continuing to do your work um, and get a sense of what you're doing and the quality of um, what you're doing it to. So those are some points. Lucy, can I ask you another question? Have, have, your have, have your guidelines changed with the development of social networks and other types of data that you can actually start to get a better sense of an artist's um, sort of position in mm -hmm. the community? Um, yes, we've, we've um, been trying to been, be as responsive as we can in the governmental agency to um, all the changes that have been happening. Um, but I think some of the fundamental questions are still the same. That yes, you know, to reach your audience, you can use social networking tools, or you can use, you know, the standard word of mouth, uh, or you know, you can use, you know, any number of um, tools that you have access to. It's the point is to be able to articulate what tools you're going to use and how you're going to reach them, because in articulating your plans you're articulating that you have thought this out and this is kind of your blueprint for going forward. As um, a funding um, panel, we, don't, we only see proposals coming in. We're not seeing the project already happening and we're funding you know, post you're finishing this, this project. We're believing and we're, we're looking for evidence and we're looking for documentation that you can carry it forward. And, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, I think for either Scott or Randall, I have a question about artists um, investing in some of the documentation that, I, that we think is important for us to understand what they're doing. Mostly because um, there was, was at a, an event we did last fall, there was an artist that was um, upset with YouTube um, videos of her performances that weren't very good quality, but they were getting the most hits. And so she didn't think it was a, best, a good representation of her work. Yeah. So, um, so have you ever counseled people about, you know, hey, get a nice HD quality of, uh, copy of a of a recent performance or, you know, great photos, something that they control and actually invest a little bit of money in, so potentially. I, I think one of the one of the things that I see most frequently in the last few years mm -hmm. is artists and arts organizations not investing in really good quality materials, and it costs them in terms of media coverage. Um, I think what's happened is because there are really great HD cameras available and really great digital still cameras available and home recording studios and like that, that people think that because that is accessible, that just because they're using those machines, it makes a good photograph, it makes a good videotape, and there's a lot more that goes into it. So. Uh, you know, depending on the individual budget, and again, it's much more challenging for emerging and younger artists and, and newer organizations to come up with this, but it really does pay off. Um, if you, for every photograph that you see in the Pink Pages or in the Chronicle on a daily basis, they've gotten hundreds of photos from people. So it's really a choice of a handful of photos in addition to the newspaper or magazine from hundreds. And the criteria that they use include quality, 
the composition of the photo? Is it a professional photo? Is it really high resolution and not just 72 DPI that works on a website but not in a newspaper? So you really need to think through these things and just make that bold step of investing in good photos, which can have a shelf life of a number of years for you. But uh, I see that even large organizations making the mistake of going on the cheap with, with their media and materials and it really costing them. Yeah, it doesn't have to, you're talking about investing, it doesn't cost a lot to do a lot of this these days. I mean, you know, to buy a, a flip video and have your friends sit there and you know, record it in HD is, is not difficult. The key is to have good friends. I mean, really, um, because you need all the resource, truly, I mean, not, not a joke, you've got to have people helping you. I mean, you know, I, I can't tell you how many great jazz artists' wives are their managers. And that's a great friend. I mean, there's a whole, you know, a lot of famous, famous musicians um, to, who have done that. I mean, and that friend, you know, this is, no one's making a lot of money here uh, in, in this particular realm here. And in having good material that you can do the best with. When I was a publicist, I counseled a lot of people on how to put together press kits that didn't cost much. You know, how to manipulate just, you know, having a good sense of graphics and things that stand out. It's, it's competitive. What Scott's talking about is that for a newspaper editor or for a, a, a festival or an, a, a program or at a nightclub or concert hall, it's competitive. You're looking at materials. You want to see good examples of work. I mean, the other thing that SF Jazz does is we also, you know, manage and produce a group of our own. So I'm, we're out there hustling gigs like you all as well, too. And, um, you know, we, we got a gift at one point uh, of a good video. The band was on tour in Europe, and it was shot for Europe, a European television, French television, and we got the rights. We, we negotiated the rights to own that which then now all those snippets are up on YouTube and it's the highest quality stuff and it cost us nothing to do that. So trying to be clever and think about how to do that when you can and if it isn't the French television station, that kind of resource, it can it literally can come down to that buddy with the flip video that, that can sit there and catch, catch you when the lighting is good. I mean, think about the production values and all those things that's going to make you look better. Okay. Canadian television. Oh, Canadian, yes. Okay, question. Yeah. Oh, just a minute. We're going to go with the microphone. Well, I have a comment and also a question. On, the, on, the, on what you were just talking about, we've had... Um, sort of bootleg video taken of us that from a, a you know a little two hundred dollar camera and it almost always even if it looks okay which it usually doesn't usually sounds pretty bad so we invested uh... i think we invested maybe six hundred dollars on having a guy come and bring two hd cameras to the freight and salvage and and we got a pretty good product that you know quintupled the quality of our presentation on youtube i think that's a hugely important thing these days a lot of presenters are not even listening to CDs anymore. They're going straight to YouTube. My question is on a di different subject, which is, you know, a lot of us are still kind of emerging artists in terms of having a fan base. And what are presenters and media doing to continue to help an artist build their audience? I mean, there's a chicken and egg thing. You don't want us to, you know, the, the big venues don't want you to play until you can fill a a significant number of seats, but if we don't get in front of those audiences, how are people going to see us? Now the brutally honest part. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, this is really, this is the back to friends again. Um, you, you got you got to hustle. I mean, this is what it's about. And, you know, if you can go to your neighborhood coffee house and prove to a presenter that you're filling 50 seats, you know, every Thursday night, that's what it takes, unfortunately. I mean, the role of the presenter can help artists a little bit, the opening acts that can do that. But people, th there's, a, there's a kind of a false belief that, you know, if I get that one opening act gig, it's going to break it all for me, and it's going to change the whole thing. It, it, it ain't true. Um, it may help a little bit, but the thing that helps far more than that is getting more of those building the fan base literally yourself from the ground up. And that's why those wives and friends and boyfriends and girlfriends and everyone else you can get to sort of come to the gig, spread the word, do the thing. It, 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 it actually is a, a, a stratified kind of thing. And if, if people like your work, uh, there's a guy who used to work at the San Francisco Foundation named John Kreidler who wrote a great paper a number of years ago about 
you know, the, the, you know, the arts world falling apart <laughs> a while ago, the sort of the nonprofit arts world. Um, but you know, one of the theories he had was just about, you know, the best proof of, you know, someone giving you a break is that you have done the work and you've got the fan base. And it does seem chicken and eggy, the whole thing. I mean, this is one of the, the great dilemmas and the most difficult part of being both a presenter and an artist. It's hard for a presenter to take a chance when you're depending on the, the receipts from that to come in. And um, you, know, you, you, you take risks sometimes. And sometimes you win, and when you win, that's great. Um, and when you lose, that's not so great. And are you willing to try it again the next time with either that artist or another artist? And a lot of it really, oddly enough, falls back a lot on the artist. Not just what they can do for that gig, but again, it's friends. How many friends you get to the gig? I mean, I can't tell you the number of times who feel like they've made it. They got their San Francisco Jazz Festival gig and they show up and they do nothing for the gig. Um, and then they're really disappointed when not enough people came. And we do you know, the same. We're hustling our publicity and our marketing, and we send out our multi-thousand, tens of thousands pieces. And, those mul and we're reaching those people. But as we reach those people, it doesn't mean those people are going to know you, say. Um, it can soften them a little bit. We've got, it up, we've got your music samples up on our website. We've got the whole thing. But what it fundamentally, and you know, this is the brutal truth part, <laughs> it comes down to you a lot of this. And it's, it's hard. I, I cannot tell you how much I understand how hard it is to be in that particular sense. The energy it takes to create the music, then you have to have the energy to hustle an audience. I mean, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a wonderful situation, but ultimately it comes down to this weird commerce in the end, which is you know, that presenter or that club or that whatever it is has to be able to do business. And it isn't just dollars business, it's happy customers. Customers will come back again who enjoyed it, who went there, that people feel the energy of that. And, um, I think this is, to me, the most difficult part of my job and your job is just the, the, the emerging artist piece of it, just as you described yourself. You know, how you crack that next level to get so that someone would consider you for the club gig or is going to do you a multi-night club gig or the bigger concert hall gig. It's, it's, um, there's no easy answer to this one. Uh, Kevin, we'll do two more questions. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that um, access uh, I know the Access Bay Area, the uh, East Bay in San Francisco, they have the local cable channel. If you take some classes, you'll have access to their cameras, and they're really high-quality cameras, and it's a very inexpensive way if you're willing to spend the time to you know, have a friend shoot your video for you um, to get that quality video that you can post to YouTube. Yeah, great tip. Yeah, my question has, um, in terms of video, is there any value to um, what I'll, I'll call an informational video, like a three to four minute video where um, you put it together where it's a sample of your work, um, samples of some video shots of you performing and also you talking and answering questions about who I am as an artist, what my, you know, my positioning is. Is that of any value um, PR-wise and or to a presenter as an information to see if this is someone you want to book and or will it help promotionally? Right. I think there is value to it. You have to think carefully what who the end user is. So you might think about um, taping so that you can slice and dice it in a number of different ways. For instance, <clears throat> there are a couple of television stations that still We'll use DVD footage on like hot tickets and critics pick sort of thing. Channel 7 does one, Channel 4 does one um, in the local Bay Area market. And they want broadcast quality video. They're not going to use something of you talking. They're going to want actually something that looks like a performance. If it's in a studio, maybe, but as long as it looks like a performance, not you hanging off of a cable car unless your performance is site specific off of a cable car. So that's, that's one application. Um, in terms of a video news release, I think it's always compelling to have you know video of somebody talking about their work. I don't know if I would personally say do a Q&A, but you doing your artist statement or your vision statement or having somebody interview you about your work might be a good way to, to you know, handle that. But yeah, I think using creative media that way. But again, be really clear who the multiple audiences maybe are going to be for that. And a presenter might want some of that, but not all of that. So I'll let Randall answer that part of it. Yeah, for me, no. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a nice thing, but it, it doesn't help whatsoever. I mean, the one thing, actually, the one, just a little more, I've been thinking about this last question, which is a tough one, too, about presenting yourself. Uh, the people on our side of the fence 
really want to find artists. I mean, this is the other part. We really want you. Um, you know, and so, you know, a lot of times it appears the other way around, like we're trying to push our work, you know, you're trying to push your work on, and it's so hard to get the attention and everything. Like that. But the truth is, it's the other way around. I, you know, I am constantly looking, you know, when, when you know, I'm not waiting for the mail to come in, in, in my place. But so this issue of a video that talks about you as an artist or the, the stuff, those things can kind of help, but the main thing is I'm out there talking to other presenters, uh, musicians, like that. My main, the, the people I trust the absolute most are musicians. Now, uh, when I get a musician recommendation of somebody, you should listen to this, that to me is the one where I, I go out and seek it. So, back to your friends again. I mean, that's the best way to sort of get to the world. I mean, these, these aren't high tech things and, and all, all stuff too, but we on the the booking side are, are looking the same I think you can say about the on the funding side we also you know apply for funds as a nonprofit so I mean you know we sit on a lot of different sides of, of this equation here and you know that the thing about reading the application is just huge I mean you know when we send out grant applications it's the first question you know that we ask in the office did we answer all the questions <laughs> you know it sounds like such a simple simple thing but you on all fronts from Booking yourself from presenting yourself. Did, did, are you sure that you're answering the questions that the presenter wants to know, or the funder? Well, we just have one minute left. I thought I'd ask Lucy if you had any last thoughts about this as we close out the panel. Sure. Um, well, along those lines with artistic work samples, because it, it plays such a huge part in your application, and um, for to do a quick um, trailer of you know mini segmented clips. Um, doesn't really help for um, the panels that I have observed who really want to see the progression, a progression of, um, you know, either you know, either the um, a section of music um, to really tell, um, you know, what the composition is to really hear where it's going and and what the style is. Um, it's for a, a review panel. It's it's much. Um, more helpful to play a longer clip so that we can really tell the quality of the work. Um, but you know, in terms of, say, if you're applying as an organization and you do a whole festival of stuff and you want to submit a trailer to show the breadth of work that you show, I think then in that case it would be helpful. So really depending on the project you're applying for and what can illuminate most what you want to do and what your ideas and concepts are. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for such a, a very informative conversation. So.